Well, good Wednesday. Uh, today is Wednesday, April the 1st, 2020, and uh, Robert Hadfield here, and Steve Miller is with me for our second part of our study of the Godhead. Steve, how you doing for week whatever of quarantine? <laughs> I think I'm doing doing fairly well. Yeah, it's it's all new adjustments, right? Yes. Yes, it is. And every day is some, something new in the news that we have to get our head around. Wow. And, yeah, and but, you know, uh, it, it seems like this month of April is going to be Real similar to what the last few weeks have been, at least from it the does. government recommendation standpoint. And so um, mm -hmm. I guess we're you and I will continue studying the Godhead on Wednesdays. What do you say? That sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. So Good this opportunity. Is, yeah, absolutely. And I'm looking forward to it. We appreciate the kind words that, that uh, you all who have watched last week have expressed. And I've talked with you in the meantime, some of you as well. And you've indicated you're looking forward to part two and, and the parts beyond. We're going to get into the essence of God today. But uh, first, we thought it would probably be good, Steve, right, to sort of review where we've been just to get us back up to speed, because each session mm -hmm. will definitely build on the other, right? That's right. Good point. Mm -hmm. So last week, we got into the fact that God has revealed himself to us, and uh, we talked about his greatness. And one of the main things, one of the main takeaways was we can know God. God has made himself knowable to us. Mm -hmm. And we got into several uh, points about that, not just nature, not just through the word, but also through his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, remembering Jesus, you know, talking, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And then we got into talking about how God is one, but there are three eternally distinct personalities in one divine essence. And so God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy spirit. And we talked about the importance of the three and their relationship, their unity, their works. And uh, that's kind of where we began mm -hmm. for us to roll in today to uh, beginning in some of the attributes. Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks for reviewing that for us. We, we did cover a lot of ground last week and we, we I don't even know that we scratched the surface, but just trying to give us some maybe simple and overarching biblical principles that'll help us to begin mm -hmm. to get our minds around as much as we can what God yeah. has revealed to us about who he is. Um, mm -hmm. This is an overarching study. This is admittedly a very broad subject, and yeah. uh, it, because of time constraints as well as just mm -hmm. our own mental abilities, we'll only be able to cover <laughs> so much of it at any one time. And we need sure. to understand that this is an overarching study, and really, yeah. if, you're, if you're contemplating any one aspect of who God is, really that's incomplete until you take into account all of who God says he is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important principle as we proceed. Uh, there mm -hmm. were some things in your research, right, Steve, that uh, maybe has come to the top that you wanted to share with us as we get going this week, right? Yeah, I wanted to share a, a couple of quotes from uh, a book called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. And it's, it's a great study, and um, it, it focuses along the lines of what we're trying to do. It's kind of an introduction, if you will. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you could go down any of these paths, right, and, and get into a lot uh, deeper study. But I want to quote him. He said, what were we made for? To know God. What aim should we set ourselves in life? To know God. What is the best thing in life bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else? Knowledge of God. And there he quotes Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me. I thought that was a great verse to wow. use there. Mm -hmm. He said, what of all the states God ever sees man in gives God most pleasure? Knowledge of himself. And then he quotes Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. I desired the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings, says God. Hmm. Wow. And so as we think about, you know, what were we made for? What's our purpose? What's going to help us in life? Obviously, a knowledge of God, you know, what we're trying to communicate in this. And, and one more quick one mm -hmm. that relates to what we're going through, I think, today. Packer says, once you become aware that the main business that you are here for is to know God, most of life's problems fall into place of their own accord. Wow. 
And I thought, wow, that, that really hits, you know, we're, we're experiencing things in our lifetime right now that are kind of unprecedented. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of panic in places, a lot of uncertainty. But we can draw nearer to God, get to know God better. That's going to help us navigate life. That's right. Wow. And I thought he made a great point there. But. That's true. So it goes back to those two main questions that we mentioned last week, the two most important questions that anyone can answer. Number one, do I really know God? And then number mm-hmm. two, does God know me as his child? Mm-hmm. Uh, and certainly some really important things for us to consider as we think about, number one, who God is, and then the relationship mm-hmm. that God desires with us. Yeah. Well, there is a lot of comfort to the point that Packer made, I believe, in that quote you just read. There's a lot of comfort that comes to us in knowing who God is and Mm -hmm. in studying what he's revealed, and that's why we've chosen this as our topic of study for these Wednesday evening Bible uh, sessions, Bible studies together for the midweek Bible study. Maybe I should mention, by the way, for people who may be catching this on YouTube and aren't familiar, uh, Steve and I are ministers for the Church of Christ at Gold Hill Road in Fort Mill, South Carolina. It's northern, uh, central, northern South Carolina, uh, suburb of Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, so we're doing this specifically for our church family here. But if you're watching from someplace else, we're happy to have you as a part of the study as well. Mm-hmm. So today, Steve, we're going to talk about the essence and the attributes of God. We're really not going to get into the attributes very much other than maybe to introduce for the sake of contrasting that with what God's essence is. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that I've summarized this in the past is to do it kind of in this way. God's essence refers to basically his substance, who God is, and his attributes refer to his qualities, what it is that God does. And we can, you know, you can segment these attributes depending on who you read. They may segment these in different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, some folks talk about the non-moral attributes of God, like uh, God is omnipotent, uh, all-powerful, omnipresent, uh, all-everywhere present, omniscient, all-knowing. Those would be, quote-unquote, non-moral attributes of God. Mm -hmm. And then there are the moral attributes of God, like his holiness, his love, his justice. And it's out of those, of course, that the standard of morality by which we will be judged by God, uh, that those things flow. And so to understand that these things are really an aspect of the nature of God is important. God's not arbitrarily making rules for us. It's not that God likes to say, well, you know, today I'm feeling like thou shalt not murder, but I could change my mind later. You know, it's not that he drew arbitrary lines in the sand. God is just. God is holy. God is love. Mm -hmm. And other things we'll talk about later, the Lord willing. And because of that, this is things that are flowing from his very nature, his attributes, and therefore we are, if we will be godly people to be like that. And so, um, God's essence, who God is, God's attributes, qualities, what it is that God does. Um, Anything really we need to add to that in addition to before we sort of get going with this study today? I think that's all good. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, I know a lot of the books you'll pick up, like a lot of systematic theologies, which is just simply studying doctrine by doctrine. Mm -hmm. You know, here's a chapter on angels. Here's a chapter on... um, the church. Here's a chapter on last things. Which in the Bible is spread out all over different sections of scripture, but a systematic theology would give the, combine those all together, right? Yeah. Collecting all the, all the teachings and just studying that particular topic, which is so valuable, Oh yeah, you know, to to get a grasp on a certain teaching. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of those will use for the non-moral, they'll say that's incommunicable. Yes. And the idea is that, you know, God's all powerful. Well, I'm not all powerful. (laughs) I'm not all knowing. I'm not everywhere at the same time like God is. And the other one is communicable where there are, there is a measure of holiness, right? We, we, we can embody Mm -hmm. love, justice, kindness, goodness. And, um, but it's neat how you see a lot of those terms and, uh, you know, that's, that's all that that's referring to. Yeah, that's right. Communicable things that we can do. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, traits, characteristics of God that we can embody, albeit not perfectly as God does, right? But 
to to try to measure up to that standard, and then mm-hmm. incommunicable things that cannot be, so to speak, transferred to us. I'll never be everywhere present. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, yeah. And w- wouldn't want to be, right? Uh, no. <laughs> we the, would want to. In fact, you know, it, it, think <laughs> about it. We're watching the news feed so much these days, and you can get you know information overload is a real thing. You know, there comes a yes. time I've got to turn it off. But right. uh, God doesn't get information overload, even though he knows every thought of every human being who has ever lived, you know, yes. a running tally of the number of hairs on our heads, as Jesus would say. Right. Um, that's amazing, isn't it? It is. And and again, who God is, knowing him and him knowing us and all of us going through different things yep. all the time. He's aware. He helps. He mm-hmm. assists. He, you know, uh, we just just amazing. Yeah. I was talking with uh, one of our sisters just a few minutes ago this morning, and she mentioned that during these times, a verse that's keeping her a lot of comfort, and I'll pass this along because maybe uh, it could comfort all of us as well, is Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's applicable to what we're talking about here, to know that God is God and he's on the throne. There's a lot of comfort Mm -hmm. to know that I, as the biblical uh, writers would say, dwell in the hollow of his hand. And uh, that's just an amazing concept. Yeah, that's that's rich. So we're talking today about, we're, we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about the essence of God, who God is. And the Lord willing, in the future, we'll look at the attributes, what it is that God does. But, you know, really, these two are, are so interwoven that you cannot fully consider one without also looking at the others. And I think sometimes we can we can get into trouble when we try and just focus on one without balancing it with the others. Mm-hmm. You know, um, sometimes we that will even cause us to pit one against another. How can right. God be all perfectly loving but also be perfectly just? You know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. how can God be a consuming fire like the book of Hebrews says, but, you know, at the same time, it's not God's will that any should perish but that all should come to repentance, right? Like like right. First Timothy mm-hmm. 2 or Second Peter chapter 3 would say. And so we've got to c- consider these all together because— yeah. Every one of these is what makes God God, and and mm-hmm. uh, they sort of influence each other as we go through it. So right, there's to be a consistency, right? That's and right, a, and are, they all relate. That's exactly right. So uh, let's start out by talking about the essence of God, and this is where we're going to be for this study today, um, for the remainder of our time together. And uh, Steve, where do we need to start as we think about God's essence, who God is? I think the first place would be God is spirit. John chapter 4, verse 24. Uh, You know, we uh, touched upon this in the past as well as he's been in this discussion and worship comes to the forefront and his purpose and looking for the Messiah. And, um, well, actually, if we, you know, back up and and look at verse 23, Mm -hmm. where the, you know, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. And then Jesus makes the the statement, you know, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So God is spirit, and uh, this is is another area where our minds begin to get a little bit blown. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Because this, this... basically means that God is not physical. Uh, uh, the obvious exception being when Jesus came to earth, when, when he was, as we say, incarnated. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and even then, you know, Philippians chapter 2 is very careful to detail that Jesus existed as God. He is deity and he demonstrated that as we read through the gospel accounts time and time again through the miracles that he did and, and so on. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, Jesus was also flesh, and therefore he can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Hebrews 4.15, uh, he knows what it's like mm-hmm. to be us. All right, so with, with that exception, uh, when God became flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, God in his essence is spirit. And it's interesting to me that we're not talking about worship this uh, during this study, but Jesus appeals to that fact, God is spirit, to mm-hmm. tell us that worship is engaging in a spiritual activity. So I'll just mm-hmm. throw that along the side and let us, right. you, maybe you at home can chew on that for a little while. 
but this means that God is not a physical being. And that sends us down a, a, a ton of rabbit holes, doesn't it, Steve, biblically speaking? It does. It can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what do we make of the fact that sometimes the Bible will refer to physical aspects of God, you know, talking about the eye, you know, the eyes of the Lord mm-hmm. are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers, the psalmist says, and Peter mm-hmm. quotes in 1 Peter 3, verse 12. Um, you know, the Bible uses uh, a certain figure of speech known as anthropomorphism. <laughs> Boy, I've been practicing that word all day, so I could say it here. <laughs> you probably should have made a slide and throwed that up there because I can't. I'm yeah. not sure how to spell that. There you go. You know, maybe yeah. maybe, I'll, maybe I'll stick that up on the screen. Anthropomorphic <laughs> expressions, and and what that basically means is the Bible will refer to God in terms of having a physical manifestation. And, and the only reason that the Bible does that is to comfort us so that we can know God looks at us. His eyes are on mm-hmm. us. His hands are quick to action. Sometimes the uh, if, if I'm, my memory serves in the Psalms, it'll talk about how God rises from his seat as though he's getting ready to act on our behalf. Mm-hmm. And isn't it amazing that here is our creator who is all-powerful, who spoke us into existence into a physical realm. He is completely other from that. He is not physical. Mm -hmm. And here, because he loves us so much, not only has he revealed himself to us, which is in itself an act of grace, but he revealed himself to us in terms that make sense to us. And he Mm -hmm. did that just so he can connect with us. You know, when, when, we're at, when we're explaining something to young children, we'll try and put it in terms that maybe they understand. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's hard, right? Sometimes my daughter will say, Daddy, yes. what's what's blank? And I'll uh-huh. say, uh, how do I put this in terms that you're going to get? You know, how do I make exactly. this for a three-year-old? Uh-huh. Uh, God has communicated with us in terms that we can understand, even figuratively speaking, applying his own actions in ways mm-hmm. that help us to, to feel his love for us in amazing ways. Yeah. Just simply put too, just relatable. That's right. right. Yeah. So we we can relate. We we understand those things, our hands and Mm -hmm. our eyes and our ears. Um, Isaiah 65 too, he said, I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people. Mm. You know, and that's one of, as you've already mentioned, many references to his hands, eyes, feet, and so on. Um, I found this, and this was good. I thought a little bit of application with that. Mm -hmm. Thinking of his eyes and ears, we understand his omniscience, his constant watchful care, his willingness to hear our prayers. Mm -hmm. Uh, When we think about references to his face, we think maybe about the manifestation of his favor toward us. Mm -hmm. His mouth, think of him giving us his revelation of his will. Mm -hmm. His uh, nostrils are even mentioned, and the idea someone made there was the acceptance of our prayers. Wow. And by his heart, the sincerity of his affections, and by his hand, the strength of his power. And what valuable lessons in all of those Mm -hmm. we can take and study out and apply. Uh, But again, being relatable, I think. To us in our minds. That's just, right. That's evident. So, as an example, just back to 1 Peter 3 12, quoting the psalmist, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, his ears mm-hmm. are open unto their prayer. But mm-hmm. the face of the Lord, you mentioned the, the face of God communicates his favor. Well, that mm-hmm. passage says, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So, mm-hmm. they do not have the favor of God. And, you know, that, that helps oh, to round out, to apply. Uh, mm-hmm. to relate that passage to us in, in some amazing ways. It does. Now, so then somebody might be thinking, okay, well, how do you know then that this is all figures of, these are all figures of speech? Well, uh, first of all, John 4, 24 says God is spirit. Well, what does that exactly mean? Well, it, it means in part that God is invisible, at mm-hmm. least to our in our physical realm. So Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says, uh, for since... The creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, how? Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and divine nature, or the New King James says Godhead, so that they are without excuse. All right, what's Paul saying there? Okay, he's saying an invisible God is manifested by the things that God has done. All right, 
we sing to God be the glory, great things he hath done. Mm-hmm. Colossians 1.15, talking about Jesus, says that he, Jesus, is the image or the manifestation of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So it's no wonder that Jesus says, well, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. Mm-hmm. First Timothy 1.17 says, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So these are just a couple or maybe three or so passages that indicate to us that God is invisible. We, we cannot mm-hmm. see him, but we can see the things that he does, evidence of mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. It's great material. <laughs> it, you know, it, it is it, admittedly, you know, this is something that can be difficult to get our minds around. Uh, but I'm just comforted by by what we continue to emphasize that uh, mm-hmm. that God has made Himself known to us for the purpose of relating to us. Now, exactly, John passages like uh, John one eighteen are also interesting to us, where uh, there John says, "No one has seen God at any time." Mm-hmm. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Uh, mm-hmm. The term means that Jesus has unfolded to us and helps us understand mm-hmm. a little better who God is. He has declared God, but no one has seen God at any time. John would write something similar in 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, when he says, no one has seen God at any time. Mm-hmm. All right, But then he follows it up by saying, but if we love one another, God abides in us. And his love has been perfected in us. I really like Mm -hmm. that verse because it essentially is saying, as far as I'm concerned, that God, we while we cannot see God, we can, so to speak, show God to one another by the love Mm -hmm. that we extend to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, Steve, I'm reminded during these times that we're showing God to each other in a lot of amazing ways. And uh, I think Mm -hmm. that all the the community around us, too, is, is taking note of that. And I'm thankful for that. And, you know, tying in with that very thought, you know, in Matthew 5, letting our light shine, mm-hmm. right? And and ultimately, we're trying to give the glory to God in the good works or the good deeds we try to do. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so that connects. And coming back to the, you know, God is a spirit and, you know, no way does the Bible just view God as some mere idea or some kind of an impersonal presence or experience. But Great point. Yeah. He's an actual person who does speak, he loves, he expresses himself in blessings and in his wrath and, and all of these different ways. Yeah. Um, That's a great point. So um, I have had some people that have asked me some questions sometimes. All right, so I hear John one eighteen and 1 John 4.12, and there are some other passages to which we might could turn as well. Nobody has seen God at any time. Well, what about <laughs> uh-huh. X, Y, Z? Yeah. Uh, you know, Isaiah and Isaiah chapter six, who is, you know, sees this vision of the heavenly temple and, and God is there and the cherubim are there. But it's just that, right? It's a vision. Somebody, some mm-hmm. people say, what about Moses, you know, who is up on the mountain and he asks to see God and God says, you can't, nobody can see me and live. Right. But instead you come to the cleft of the rock and I will take my hand. All right. We've already talked about anthropomorphism. Mm-hmm. I won't take my hand. And I'm going to cover you, and then you'll be able to see my back. And, you know, it, well, if God is spirit, what 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 is the back? You know, what is yeah, that? exactly. You know, we're talking about, I, I, I would liken these, and maybe this is overly simplistic, um, and, and if you're a, a Bible scholar, then don't uh, take me to task too much on this. <laughs> but, you know, I would liken this maybe to uh, the pillar of fire and the, the, the cloud of smoke or to mm. the uh, burning bush. Uh, something mm-hmm. like that. God manifests himself, and he has done so, it's especially in the past, in miraculous and in physical ways mm-hmm. for the purpose of communicating with his people in those specific times. But, but the Bible continues to emphasize God is invisible. No man has seen God. And it's because of that then that, that I think we must conclude that people have seen in the Old Testament and New Testament times manifestations of God. Uh, They can see God in the Mm -hmm. sense of what he does. But John 1.18 and 1 John 4.12 still says, no person has seen God at any time. And by the way, think about it. Moses just saw 
a manifestation or, or some kind of visual manifestation of the back of God. And you remember mm-hmm. when he comes down off the mountain, even that experience causes his face to literally glow. And it scares the people to death, you know. <laughs> they, right. they make Moses go hide himself in the tent for a while until that wears down. Uh-huh. Yeah. So uh, it just tells us something about the amazing presence of God. It does. It does. And I think you, the reference to earlier was Exodus thirty three twenty, where yeah. Moses was told, you know, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. And I think, as we mentioned earlier, okay, we have to find consistency and, uh, and, you know, um, there's a, there's a tie in a unity here with these verses that, that you just explained. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing, right? If we're going to take God's word, you know, I think that the mm-hmm. psalmist says the sum of your word is truth. And right. so we're, we're going we're gonna to look at what it says here and there and mm-hmm. uh, try and bring those yeah. things together into a unity. I think that's right. important. So uh, that's sort of the fact that God, in essence, who God is, God is spirit. Anything else, Steve, we need to add to that before we move to the next point of emphasis? Oh, wow. Well, there's, there's so many things we could, could go down there and get into worship and so forth, but mm-hmm. I, we'll, we'll save that for another time. Okay, sounds good. So let's talk about then the personality of God and look at some of the personality traits as we continue to think about God's essence, who God is. Now, mm-hmm. some of these personality traits that we're going to mention will also give way into some of the moral attributes of God. And so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, an example we're going to give in just a second is that God is loving. God loves, but it also says that God is love. And mm-hmm. so that, that is both a part of his essence, who he is, but also a, an aspect of the moral attribute of God. God is mm-hmm. love. That's his essence. God loves. That's a moral attribute. So we'll, we'll mm-hmm. get into some of that. And again, it, it kind of depends on who you read. <laughs> it is. <laughs> which which systematic right. theology you pull off the shelf <laughs> as to how they're going to maybe categorize and, and uh, distinguish some of these from others. But mm-hmm. we're talking right now about the personality of God as an aspect of his essence. And uh, Steve, maybe we can just sort of go back and forth with some of these. Uh, you sure. want to start us off with this list? Yeah, the first one we have is self-awareness. Hmm. Found in Exodus three fourteen, I am that I am. It's a powerful statement, isn't it? Oh, it is. And and again, these are some of these are literally lifetime statements, aren't they? That you just oh, yeah. continue to think about, and and you, when you hear it taught or preached on or studied or read something else, or someone else has been digging around in that, again, new new thoughts. You know, mm-hmm. new new things come to surface that you hadn't thought about before. Right. Uh, a unique phrase, yes, that, that certainly refers to the self-awareness of God, the fact that he is. And, of course, you know, Jesus in John chapter 8, I think it is, right, will use that same phrase. Before Abraham mm-hmm. was, I am. I am. Mm-hmm. And when he said that, the, his audience, the Jews, immediately knew what he was claiming. He was claiming yes. equality with the great I am, going back mm-hmm. to Exodus chapter 3. He was right. claiming to be God. That uh-huh. is a vital part of who God is. And you say, we, we could, boy, we could do a whole quarter, I guess, on oh, I am that I am. <laughs> that's huge. Yeah. And earlier, the references, you know, where Jesus stated, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. That ties right in with that as well. That's right. what you said in John 8. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's true. All right. In the second place, we could talk about God's intellect. God knows. Uh, he said of Abraham in Genesis eighteen nineteen. I have known him or chosen him, the ESV says, in order that he may command his children and his household after him to, that they, to keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Uh, he says, yeah, I know, I know Abraham. Uh, I know him. We could go to Exodus chapter 3, verse 17 again. Um uh, I have said I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Well, here was God claiming he was aware of the things that his people, the children of Israel, were going through in their Egyptian bondage, and he also had a plan for them. I could come over to Acts chapter 15, verse 18 where I'm just going to lift the phrase for now, and we can establish the context maybe at some other time, but the text says, known to God from eternity are all his works. 
Mm-hmm. So, so God has the capacity to know. And this, I think, speaks, Steve, to what you were mentioning a little bit earlier as well. You know, we, we shouldn't just think of God as a, a force. Uh, we should think of God as a person, as a mm-hmm. being who is, as we've already mentioned, self-aware and also has mm-hmm. the capacity of knowledge. And, of course, he is omniscient. He is all-knowing. Mm-hmm. Where else do we need to go on this list? The capacity to love, of course, this one would be at the top of a lot of people's lists. And mm-hmm. you think of John three sixteen, God so loved the world. Uh, and we just, you know, again, that's a whole lesson in and of itself. <laughs> but having the capacity to do what we are in need of, you know, we're in need of being saved, in need of a savior of forgiveness. And certainly God has demonstrated that. And, and that's a kind of a step off from John 3.16, right, to, to save the world, to save man, uh, those that would be obedient to his will. Connected with that's 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, and tied in with John 3. Beloved, let us love one another, and also John 13, right, you know, yeah. 34 and 35. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. You talk about a, a whole systematic study is right there in those verses, right? right? Yeah, you're exactly Remind right. Us, God is love, and this is where this all issues forth. And you mentioned earlier about our application of doing good. Mm-hmm. That stems all the way back to God is love, right? Mm. And that attribute that he is love. That's right. All right, so God loves. And then God mm-hmm. certainly has the capacity mm-hmm. of sorrow. Mm-hmm. I look to uh, Genesis 6-6, six, six, perhaps most notably, the Noahic flood, and uh, as all this is beginning in terms of the narrative, we read that the Lord God regretted, the ESV says. Um, the New King James says that he was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Um, you know, again, we've got some anthropomorphic phrases that are being used here, the heart of God, and yet mm-hmm. we're talking about that God is an emotive being. He, he's emotional. He has emotions. Um, You know, when it says in Genesis 6, 6, that the Lord God was sorry or that he regretted, you know, the idea in the Hebrew word means that he is sighing. He has pity. Uh, He was disheartened that it had all come to this. And so we're going to see some justice, some justice of God that is uh, exercised on the part of those who are wicked in the flood. We're also going to see the love and the grace of God. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 is going to say. And so that's an amazing study, the idea of sorrow. Interestingly, and to our point last week, there is one divine nature. God is one. And that one nature is shared by three and only three divine persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. To that point then, let me just mention that Ephesians 5 verse 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So uh, we, we put to grief God when we turn our backs on him, when we fail to do the things that he would have us to do. And so God certainly has the capacity of sorrow. Mm-hmm. So number five on the list, the capacity to be angry. Mm. One of the references we have is Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 37. Uh, Even with me, the Lord was angry on your account and said, you also shall not go in there. And of course, you know, this is in the uh, realm of Israel's rebellion uh, against God and Mm -hmm. uh, the refusal to enter the land. But taken uh, with a lot of other things, obviously, we think about, okay, God being angry or God expressing his wrath, uh, being displeased with something someone's done or the nation of Israel has done or someone in the church has done. Obviously, we, we have to keep in mind, okay, that's not the type of, of 
thing we would think about maybe in expressing this uncontrollable thing, right? right? Or we let ourselves get out of hand. But obviously this is going to be tempered with God's, okay, what's best for this person or these, this people um, and expressing his discipline toward us. Right. And I, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's all done in purity. Mm, that's right. right? And, and not, not uh, outside of that realm. And so again, another part of his uh, being that relates to all the others, but in a good way. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's talk about then the fact that God is a jealous God. And again, some of the some of the caveats that you just mentioned there, I think are important for us to think about as well. So, just like God in his anger is not an unrighteous anger, God in his jealousy is not an unrighteous jealousy. So we go to Exodus chapter 20 when God is giving to Moses what we refer to as the 10 commandments, the the basic tenets of the law of Moses. Going back to Exodus 20, verse 4, God says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. What this means, as as we said, is not that God is jealous in a sinful way, but that God basically demands our entire devotion. We are to be singular in our devotion to him. And God will not tolerate individuals turning from him to worship something else that they deem to be deity. And so he says, don't make an image that looks like anything that you've seen. After all, God made all that stuff anyway. So God is a jealous God in that he demands our full devotion. Very good. So God, we know, is compassionate. Psalm 111 and verse 4. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. And, you know, we think about God. He's created us. He knows us. He also knows now, you know, we're on this side of the fall, right? We, mm-hmm. we need help. We, uh, we're kind of our own enemy in that sense in, in that we sin and we distance and separate ourselves from God because of our sins. But he has compassion uh, upon us in that situation and on people in general, uh, I think, in, in just in life. Mm-hmm. Think about how that's another one that we can relate to, you know, in our daily lives. And we're called upon to follow Jesus. He looked at the crowds. He had compassion uh, in the people in their place. And we mm. need to as well. Yeah, I love that. That's a great point. And then the last thing that we want to mention uh, on this list, and perhaps, again, this is not an exhaustive list, but hopefully it's (laughs) well-rounded enough, Uh is that God lives. There are at least a couple of times, in fact, there are many times, when uh, God is referred to as the living God. Think about Matthew 16, Mm -hmm. 16, when Peter confesses, you talking to Jesus, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, Paul says, They themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Mm -hmm. And I think this point is a great summary point for everything we've just mentioned because God, the fact that he's alive, implies power and activity. He is Mm -hmm. not, as we've already mentioned, just an influence or a force. You know, we're seeing this a lot in our day. People say, well, you know, ask the universe for this or that or send mm. positive vibes my way. Listen, I got something better than positive vibes or some inanimate <laughs> yeah. universe. We have yeah. a God who lives, the God mm-hmm. who lives. And therefore, oh, yeah. God is incomparable to any other idol, uh, to any idol, I should say, not another idol. That would imply that God is an idol. No, to <laughs> any idol or to any image. Paul says in Acts 17, 24 and 25. Now remember, he's Paul standing at the Areopagus in Athens, Mars Hill, as the King James mm-hmm. Version had it. Mm-hmm. And he's surrounded by all of these other structures that have been erected to various quote unquote deities, to a little g God. Mm-hmm. In Acts 17, 24, he says, God, now talking about the one true God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life and breath and all things. God is alive, 
and life itself comes from him. And uh, mm-hmm. as we're considering the points that we've made so far about the personality of God, he's self-aware, he knows, he, he is loving, he can be, uh, has the capacity of sorrow, anger, jealousy, compassionate. He's alive. He is not merely a force. He is a being. He's a person. And yeah. uh, I think that's vital for us to consider. It is. It is. What a list. Right. <laughs> I can't believe we just covered that in the amount of time that we did. <laughs> I know. But it, thankful we've had that opportunity. Yeah, that's but right. But God is self-evident, as we've mentioned, and you know, he's not dependent upon any outside factor for his existence. Mm-hmm. Think of that. You know, he's the uncaused cause. Wow. Hmm. And so. Yep. And and because of that, too, uh, because he is always the way that he is, he's the always existing one. We'll get into this. You know, this is a part of one of his attributes. He is immutable. That mean, That is, he does not change. And mm-hmm. so he will always be the way that he is. And, uh, yes. you know, I draw a lot of comfort from that. Uh, mm-hmm. even like the coronavirus and things like that, those are not a result of God changing his mind necessarily. That is to say, uh, becoming someone different than who he was. You know, God hasn't mm-hmm. decided that he doesn't love us after all, and therefore he's no. going to, you know, send this stuff to, to try and uh, annihilate us. It, it is out no. of love that God does the things that he does, as well as justice mm-hmm. and other things. And so mm-hmm. maybe that's something worth considering. And then For we sure. want to talk about the fact that God is eternal. God is eternal. Uh, there's a host of passages that really emphasize this. One to which we've already alluded is 1 Timothy 6.16. To the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, and so on. Mm-hmm. God is eternal. And, and because of that, that means that for God, eternity is right now. You know, we talk about when, when we die, we'll transition into eternity. Mm-hmm. Um, but we had a beginning. God doesn't have a beginning. And and that blows mm-hmm. my mind. I, I can't I can't wrap my mind around that. I, I I'm no. a, a finite being. You know, there's there is certainly my spirit will continue to exist from this point forward endlessly into eternity, mm-hmm. although my physical life, my physical body will not. But there was a beginning for me. You know, I can go back to my mm-hmm. birthday. <laughs> yes. And and even beyond that, as we would think in terms of uh, uh, you know, when life begins. And those mm-hmm. are things that we can think of. Those are concrete numbers. But God is eternal. And, and because of that, that means that God God doesn't exist in time like we do. Right. And what that means is that past, present, and future are really things that are only in relation to us. And God God sees it all and, and how mm-hmm. exactly he does that. You know, I like to think of it maybe as like a timeline or something. But, you know, the scriptures indicate God God knows the end from the beginning. I mean, he knows mm-hmm. exactly how everything is going to turn out mm-hmm. before. He's aware of past, present, and future. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why we can say things like the sentiment of that old song, many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know mm-hmm. who holds my hand. Uh, mm-hmm. God, in his essence, is is eternal. Yeah. That's great. Mm-hmm. And then finally, God is immense and vast. Wow. One of the passages, Jeremiah 23, 24, can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, hmm. declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? Hmm. Uh, and again, that's a, a great lesson in there. You know, we can't hide from God. Uh, but he's all all knowing and just thinking about how vast uh, his creation is, and that he's all a part of that. Right? Wow. He's all all over that. Yeah. Immeasurable. Immeasurable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And so, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, that means he's always with us. Uh, yeah. That that means you know, like I think about uh, the psalmist. Where can I go from your presence? You know, if I right. ascend to the highest peak <laughs> or descend to the lowest point of the earth, you're there. Uh, mm-hmm vast once again beyond our yeah. comprehension <laughs> yes exactly but comforting nonetheless uh, right it, and, exactly and that's and the faith point. faith building yeah. yes and that's the point uh-huh. to know yeah. that i am as we said dwelling in the hollow of his hand mm-hmm. and uh, through these times and through any other times uh i'm with him and so long as i'm with him we talk about uh, god being on our side and i understand what we mean by that 
But really, mm-hmm. I want to be on God's side. God doesn't move. Yes. And so I, I go with God wherever God leads and, and wherever God mm-hmm. wants me to be. And when I do that, I know that I have all the comfort of this being that we have tried to describe in his essence today, a spirit, a personality uh, Mm -hmm. who is self-evident, who is eternal, who is immense, who is vast. And as we mentioned at the beginning, every one of these is really connected to every other aspect of who God is. We've talked about the essence of God today and the Lord willing, Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll pick up next week. And really we've only, we haven't even scratched the surface of the essence of God and uh, what we'll do next week, the Lord willing, is begin by talking about some of the attributes of God. And I think we're going to mm-hmm. start maybe with the non-moral attributes and mm-hmm. uh, go from there. Steve, as we as we close out our, our study today, uh, what, what do we need to say just in summary or, or in conclusion for our day today? For our lesson today? Yeah. And just how, um, again, we need to use this time. You know, many are have schedules that are not normal now. Um, it's a great, great opportunity to apply the fact that I want to know God more and, and remember he is spirit and remember some of these teachings and, and spread out from them. There's many, many more, as we mentioned, that are connected and, mm-hmm. and just get to know God in a deeper way. Yeah, that's because right. Because it will help us through troubled times. And, and what a great time maybe to, to chase some of those rabbits of curiosity that you've got, you know, where yes. maybe mm-hmm. our schedules are a little clearer than they, than they typically have been. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to spend that time drawing closer to God, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. James chapter that's four, right. verse eight says, and mm-hmm. that's just an amazing thought right there. It is. It is humbling to consider how great God is and to realize that he's certainly worthy of our praise, of our mm-hmm. devotion, of our glorifying him and uh, Mm -hmm. I'm just so thankful to serve this great God with the people with whom we get to do so especially here at Gold Hill and uh, I'm reminded you know I I see God in them as 1 John 4 12 says because of the Mm -hmm. love that they show to me and that we're showing to each other during these times and my prayer I know yours is too Steve that this has been an encouraging study for for everybody yes pray that it has been yes sir well shall we conclude with a word of prayer please do that all right let's do that let's pray together our father we are honored as we contemplate the greatness of who you are as well as uh, the greatness of jesus the christ and of the holy spirit father we are humbled that uh, beings so great and vast eternal and all-knowing as you are would then show such love and mercy and grace and kindness to beings such as we are. We thank you, Father, for life itself. We thank you that you're caring for us in our needs. Father, we find ourselves in the midst of unique needs during this particular time of life. We pray, Father, for the wellness and good health of all of us, as well as that for our neighbors, too. We pray for those who have been affected by the coronavirus. We pray for those who are helping those who have been affected by the coronavirus. That you'll bless these people. And Father, if it's your will that those who are sick might recover very soon. We pray for the family members who are concerned about those as well. And Father, even in the midst of a pandemic as terrible as this, There are even other needs and concerns that we have in this life. Life, in many ways, continues to go on with other illnesses, with loss of loved ones, with stressors. Father, we pray that your peace will rest upon all of those, all of us, as we try and grapple with new normals, with quarantine, isolation, with the demands of life, that we will be wise, that you'll give us that wisdom, that we will be safe, that we will be comforted as we rest in your care. Father, we thank you for the church. We thank you for the congregation that meets at Gold Hill Road. We pray, Father, for our shepherds who watch for our souls and for every one of us that we can shine the light of Jesus to our friends and our neighbors during these trying times. We're thankful for our study together today and for everybody who's participated in this study. We pray that we can draw near to you in full assurance that as we do, 
you'll draw near to us. For Father, we need you more than anything else. Thank you for revealing yourself to us and delineating for us the way by which we can be at peace, reconciled with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Steve, I appreciate you. Thanks for our study together. I appreciate you. Thank you. And thanks all of you for joining us as well. We'll be here next Wednesday. Once again, we'll release our next video for part three of this study of God. Until then, may God bless you and yours. Thank you.